I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. For more than 300 years, millions of black people were taken from their homes, from their native countries, enslaved, kidnapped, bought, sold, and treated savagely like commodities. In 1865, the Civil War ended slavery with the Jim Crow laws, who declared that white and black people should be equal but separated and segregated in all things. Black people were no longer slaves, but they were still not free. As the nation entered the 20th century, they were still oppressed and discriminated against, as if they were not human beings. They were refused the same rights as white people. They couldn't attend the same schools, were forced to use separate public utilities and didn't have the right to vote. They lived in a segregated society. We have come a long, long way in the civil rights struggle, but let me remind you this afternoon that we have a long, long way to go. Martin Luther King Jr. was born to this world, but he would spend his lifetime fighting to change it. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The past and present was somber, but he would fight for a brighter future. As a dedicated father of four young children, he had a dream, a dream that they would be able to grow up in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their personal qualities and the force of their character. He hoped that America would become a colorblind society where race would not impact a person's civil rights. He dedicated his lifetime to support a cause that he strongly believed in, and for that, he became one of the most important figures, not just in American history, but in the story of our Earth. This is the journey of his fight for freedom. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. Yeah. Only 64 years after the end of slavery, Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia on January 15, 1929. His father was an African-American preacher, and Martin was inspired by him to pursue the same path. Soon, he excelled in public speaking, and following the footsteps of his father, he began lifting spirits of his communities. At 13, he enrolled into Booker T. Washington High School, the only school for black students in the city at the time. He then skipped grades and went to Morehouse College at the young age of 15. He was ordained a minister at 18. At 26, after getting a degree in sociology from college and a divinity degree from Crozier Seminary, he got his PhD in theology from Boston University, becoming Dr. Martin Luther King. While in Boston, he fell in love with Coretta Scott, a music student. She became his wife in 1953. Later, they would have four children. King grew up carrying the weight of oppression on his shoulders. In the 40s, another country was also fighting for its freedom. Mahatma Gandhi was leading India's fight for independence from Great Britain. 
but it wasn't an ordinary fight. He had a unique approach. Gandhi's emphasis was on love, peace, and tolerance, and he was using nonviolence and civil disobedience to protest the rule of the British over India. King was greatly inspired by his approach, and he saw that it had potential to work in his country too. Like Gandhi, he understood that violence wouldn't be a solution and that it would only justify more brutality from the government. In 1955, it was still the law that black people had to give up their seat for white people if all seats had been taken on the bus. This had always enraged him. But one day, a black woman named Rosa Parks boldly refused to give up her seat. She was arrested, but she sparked a revolution on this day, a period of change began. King led his first major civil rights action by leading the Montgomery bus boycott. He declared they would no longer pay the fare and ride the bus, which caused the public transportation system to lose a lot of money. For several weeks now, we, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, have been involved in a non-violent protest against uh, the injustices which we have experienced on the buses for a number of years. This is a non-violent protest. We are depending on moral and spiritual forces using the method of passive resistance. The boycott that he had hopefully expected to last for one day lasted for over a year. King's action gave rise to a wave of hostility from the government and death threats against him. The head of the FBI even had him placed under surveillance as a communist. He had powerful opponents and times were tense, but he refused to cooperate with an evil system. Man's inhumanity to man is what he called it, and he thought that if America was still to remain a first-class nation, it could not have second-class citizens. The prophet must remind America of the urgency of now. The oft-repeated cliches, the time is not right, Negroes are not culturally ready, are a stench in the nostrils of God. The time is always right to do what is right. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to transform the bleak and desolate midnight a man's inhumanity to man into a glowing daybreak of freedom and justice. Now is the time to open the doors of opportunity to all of God's children. Now is the time to change the pending national elegy into a creative psalm of brotherly love. In 1956, he was arrested for the first time and his house was bombed. Luckily, him and his family were left unharmed. This only fueled his desire to push through. We must meet hate with love and violence with nonviolence, he claimed in a speech invoking the words of Jesus. He stressed the importance to have love and compassion for the enemy and to realize that even the strongest opponents are also human and human life was sacred to him. Despite his arrest, the Montgomery bus boycott gained national attention. At last, a year after Rosa Parks' arrest, on November 13, 1956, the Supreme Court declared bus segregation illegal. This morning, the long-awaited mandate from the United States Supreme Court concerning bus segregation came to Montgomery. I hereby defy ruling handed down by the United States Supreme Court ordering desegregation of public care. This mandate expresses in terms that are crystal clear that segregation in public transportation is both legally and sociologically invalid. King had just experienced his first triumph and had just proven to be a powerful young leader. In 1957, he formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference which trained people in nonviolent resistance in hope to create more leaders and expand the civil rights movement. This worked, and it soon reached nationwide proportions. We will get together and be together. Black people, Mexican-Americans, American Indians, Puerto Ricans, Appalachian whites, all working together 
to solve the problem of poverty. For those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. And that is that I've fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up segregating my moral concern. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are tired of living in run-down, dilapidated, rat-infested shacks and slums. We are tired of our children All right. having to attend overcrowded, inferior school. And we are tired of our men not being able to be men because they can't find work. King made his first national speech at a civil rights rally in Washington. Throughout the 50s, he stood at the front of the movement. And despite being arrested multiple times, he still claimed he was proud of what he was doing. He was giving people back their dignity and self-respect. The Negro came to feel that he was somebody. His religion revealed to him that God loves all of his children and that all men are made in his image, and that the basic thing about a man is not his specificity, but his fundamentum, not the texture of his hair or the color of his skin, but his eternal dignity and worth. And so the Negro in America can now cry out unconsciously with the eloquent poet, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. And were I so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is the standard of the man. With this new sense of dignity and this new sense of self-respect, a new Negro came into being with a new determination to suffer, to struggle, to sacrifice, and even to die if necessary in order to be free. And this reveals that we have come a long, long way. In 1958, a mentally ill black woman attempted to assassinate King by stabbing him with a letter opener. He survived the attack. After his recovery, him and his wife visited India, and he became more convinced than ever before that nonviolent action was the best weapon available to them. The more violence he received, the more peaceful he remained. Let me say to you that we must continue to work with the right method and the right attitude. I know the temptations that come to us, those of us who have been trampled over by the iron feet of oppression so long, those of us who have been the last hired in the first fire so long, those of us who have seen the viciousness of lynching mob with our own eyes, those of us who have known the tragedies of police brutality, that is the danger that we will end up bitter. That is the danger and the ever-present temptation. We will retaliate with violence. And I hope this afternoon that we will continue to see that nonviolence is the most potent weapon available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom and human dignity. King also realized the importance of supporting younger generations, and he took part in a student movement that quickly expanded nationally. He was again doing the right thing as young people started bringing a new and positive energy into the movement. This unprecedented gathering of young people I cannot help thinking that a hundred years from now, the historians will be calling this not the peak generation, but the generation of integration. In 1960, President JFK was elected, 
and the time came for the first meaningful government action to take place. Eventually, he decided to bring public awareness to the civil rights movement. In the next years following his election, it had gained more popularity throughout white people, and more of them joined in demonstrations, challenging discriminatory laws. In 1961, segregation was officially ended in interstate travel. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal, and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. Today we are committed to a worldwide struggle to promote and protect the rights of all who wish to be free. It ought to be possible, therefore, for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race, or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated. The Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the state in which he is born, has about one half as much chance of completing a high school as a white baby, born in the same place on the same day. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man twice as much chance of becoming unemployed. 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. In 1962, the first black student, James Meredith, was admitted at the University of Mississippi. In the beginning of 1963, the movement was still growing, but it didn't come without a harsh cost. Larger and larger demonstrations were taking place, along with more violent and cold-blooded confrontations from the police. People of all ages, even children, were getting arrested in mass and killed in protests. But the pressure and need for change was never greater than in 63. The movement remained peaceful, and this was powerful. It made America finally realize that Black people were being victimized by an incredibly wrong system. Justice was long awaited, and people could no longer wait. JFK declared that he had seen enough and urged for a peaceful revolution to take place. Because somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. Pleasure now to present the moral leader of our nation, one who has conducted a massive moral campaign in the southern area of the nation against the citadel of racism, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. In August 1963, King helped to organize the famous and historic March on Washington for freedom and jobs. Over 250,000 people, black and white, attended this march in an effort to show the importance of civil rights legislation. It was at this march where King uttered the most iconic words, which are still seared in the minds of so many. They reached and impacted millions. They made Americans feel free.
five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. No, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This speech has become one of the most famous, influential, and transformative speeches in history. The march was seemingly a success, although hatred and violence against black people seem to continue. On November 22, 1963, the world received devastating, shocking news. JFK was assassinated. The man in the fight for justice and representing hope for the future had just died. Dreams were shattered. America's persistent, violent climate proved that there was still a lot to do and to overcome. King even said that in these conditions, he saw the same thing happening to him and that he would never see his 40th birthday. In 1964, new President Lyndon Johnson was elected and America began the Vietnam War. The country was more divided than never before. King kept hope that greatest achievements were yet to come. He wasn't wrong. Johnson committed himself to complete Kennedy's work. In fact, later the same year, President Johnson's first achievement became his greatest as passed a law prohibiting all racial discrimination, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which became the most important legislation bill signed since the 15th Constitutional Amendment of 1870. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. Its purpose is national, not regional. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. So tonight, I urge every American to join in this effort to bring justice and hope to all our people and to bring peace to our land. There's warm applause for members of both parties at the president's Noticing the developments, noticing what was happening 
noticing what was being done on the part of his black brothers and sisters in Africa, gave him a new sense of dignity in the United States and a new sense of self-respect. The Negro came to feel that he was somebody. His religion revealed to him that God loves all of his children and that all men are made in his image and that the basic thing about a man is not his specificity but his fundamental. But the battle wasn't won and King continued to fight against what he called the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism. Well, he's a white man, but to win his friendship and understanding and the end is reconciliation and the creation of the beloved community. We are not seeking to annihilate the opponent, but to convert him. And this is why we follow nonviolence. Uh, I think uh, the end of violence is to get rid of, uh, to annihilate the opponent. But in the nonviolent movement, the end is to convert the opponent and to bring about a society where all men will live together as brothers and every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. This same year, Time Magazine named him Man of the Year for his leadership, and later he became the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize for Peace. King was making history, but it all came at a cost. There would be more arrests and killings. Violent anti-racism movements started arising as well. For the first time, King experienced violence directed against him by black power militants who wanted to respond with violence to violence and were against his peaceful approach, which was often questioned as it seemed to become more and more ineffective. In 1965, the three-protest march from Selma to Montgomery was organized to be an orchestrated push for the right to vote. It became the high point of the civil rights movement, even though it was unsuccessful. The peaceful protesters were stopped by state troopers who met them with incredible brutality. Dr. King, uh, Peter Woods from Independent Television in London. Oh, yeah. Uh, this must be quite a, a moment for you, having come over the bridge where you were stopped last time. Yes, it is a very high moment. I think a great moment in our struggle, the fact that so many people were brutalized at that very point, and today we can march by that point and continue to move means that we are making progress and that we have touched the conscience of a large segment of our nation. Do you, were you disappointed?
At the same time in New York City, while the march was happening in Selma, Malcolm X, another popular African-American figure in the fight for freedom, was assassinated in Harlem by black Muslims. He was the first martyr of the civil rights movements. In 1967, the cities of Los Angeles, Detroit, and Newark were shattered by intense and devastating riots, aiming to end discrimination in housing, employment, and schooling systems. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 had been passed, but people were struggling to notice real change. Many were killed, properties were destroyed, thousands were left homeless. Again, peace was proving to be almost impossible in this turbulent social and political climate. It was on an extremely hot afternoon last June that a young, vigorous, intelligent, dedicated president stood before the nation, said in eloquent terms that the issue which we face in civil rights is not merely a political issue, it is at bottom a moral issue. He went on to say that it is as old as the scriptures and as modern as the Constitution. It is a question of whether we will treat our Negro brothers as we ourselves would like to be treated. Since that hot afternoon last June, our nation has known a dark day and a dreary night that same president was cut down by an assassin's bullet on Elm Street in Dallas, Texas. And I think the passage of the Civil Rights Bill is a lasting tribute to the memory of the late John Fitzgerald Kennedy. But the passage of the Civil Rights Bill does not mean that we have reached the promised land in civil rights. As the saying goes, every thousand mile journey begins with the first step. The passage of the Civil Rights Bill is merely a step in a thousand mile journey. We have come a long, long way in the civil rights struggle, but let me remind you this afternoon that we have a long, long way to go. Half a million troops were also fighting in Vietnam at the same time. There didn't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel. That is when King decided he couldn't stay silent anymore. He took a stand against America's involvement in Vietnam, declaring America's government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He stated it was time for America to repent and to stop being detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people. This was a bold move, and he was criticized from many. He fell into disfavor with the president, who felt personally betrayed by him as he was pursuing the war vigorously. But within one year of his speech, King's words had resonated into the public's minds and their opinion radically changed. They turned strongly against the war. Losing his support, President Johnson decided he would not run for second term as president. 
King was arguably the most important and effective American leader to take a moral stand against the Vietnam War. He didn't give up on hope for peace, claiming in another speech, we need not need violence, we need not hate. His faith kept him going, and he always believed that better days were coming and that they would eventually reach the freedom they had fought for. But I think uh, it is necessary to make it clear that there are Negroes who are presently qualified to be president of the United States. There are many who are qualified in terms of integrity, in terms of vision, in terms of leadership ability. But we do know that there are certain uh, problems and prejudices and mores in our society which make it difficult now. However, I am very optimistic uh, about the future. Uh, frankly, I have seen certain changes in the United States over the last two years that surprised me. I've seen levels of compliance with the Civil Rights Bill and changes that have been uh, most surprising. So on the basis of this, I think we may be able to get a Negro president in less than 40 years. I would think uh, that this could come in 25 years or less. By 1968, unfortunately, King had made many enemies, and a tragic incident would cut short his fight for freedom. In the spring of 1968, King traveled to Memphis, Tennessee, to support a new strike of sanitation workers. On April 3rd, he checked into the Lorraine Motel, one of the few motels in town that was known as friendly to black people he would give his last speech on that day. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. The following day, on April 4th, 1968, at 6.05 p.m., while standing on the second floor balcony, a rifle fired a bullet that struck him in the neck. He was shot dead, murdered by a white racist at the age of only 39. King was no longer standing. Bernice, his youngest daughter, was just five when she learned that their father had just been killed. His four young children would face the challenge of growing up without their father and within his shadow for the rest of their lives. James Earl Ray was convicted with his murder. It has still not been ascertained whether King's murder was part of a conspiracy or acted on his own. His death didn't silence his voice. Nothing could. Uh, Mrs. King, in this conference, will issue, an, issue a statement. My husband often told the children that if a man had nothing that was worth dying for, then he was not fit to live. He said also that it's not how long you live, but how well you live. He knew that at any moment, his physical life could be cut short. And we face this possibility squarely and honestly. My husband faced the possibility of death without bitterness or hatred. He knew that this was a sick society totally infested with racism and violence that questioned his integrity, maligned his motives, and distorted his views, which would ultimately lead to his death. And he struggled with every ounce of his energy to save that society from itself.
when he died, 200,000 Americans, black and white, marched in the streets of Atlanta following his casket. Riots broke out all around America. Tens of thousands were arrested again. But the words of Martin Luther King remained once again with the people. Nonviolence is a sword that heals. He was one of the greatest and most important speakers of modern times. America remained in a climate of violence and injustice, but King's legacy survived. Black people were given the right to vote. He also made possible the elections of Hiram Rhodes Revels, the first black U.S. Senator, the first black Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, and the first black mayors of major U.S. cities. Carol Mosley Braun was the first black woman to be elected to the Senate, and Shirley Anita Chisholm became the first black Congresswoman. The power and spirit of his activism left a glimpse of hope and had repercussions on modern society. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan declared the third Monday of every January a public holiday Martin Luther King Day to remember him. He fought many battles and helped challenge racism in the South with boycotts, sit-ins, and marches in the spirit of what's known today as Kingian nonviolence. Over the years, he was jailed over 20 times and suffered relentless attacks on himself and his family, but he never gave up. King was more than a dreamer. He was an extraordinary fearless leader with an extraordinary vision and ambition. He fought tirelessly for equality, for the freedom of black America, and for the good of humanity. He was a father of four and a hero of wonderful inspiration, courage, and eloquence. By fighting for his dreams and against injustice, he impacted generations and he changed the world. The change was slow and the fight was long and hard, and King fought with an incredible persistence and courage. He believed that with faith, they could overcome anything and make the world a better place. Today, over half a century and three generations later, America is still struggling with political and economic turmoil and with issues of racial injustice. Enough is enough was King's message, and it still resonates today. So what have we learned from him? His legacy remains a strong reminder and a profound call to action for change. Bernice King declared in 2018, my father provided some very important guidance in how we deal with conflict and polarization. I think his teaching on nonviolence are critical in this hour, now more than ever before. For more than 300 years, millions of black people were enslaved, then oppressed and alienated. But King changed the course of their history. He knew that the time had come to rise from the dark. Martin Luther King has become a model for all who want to believe in hope and that there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. From him, we learn the true meaning of the word freedom as he left an indelible mark on history. Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.